Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Christoph, and uh, I'll be sharing a little bit with you about uh, a little tool we built called Verta. Um, we sometimes uh, quite cheekily call it the Docker for VMs. You'll find that's not entirely technically true, but I think you'll see the, the resemblance. So anyway, this is about uh, testing the Linux kernel or a Linux kernel uh, module um, and kind of our approach to that and how we use that little tool that we built for for that task. So what are we going to talk about? First of all, I'll, I'll just give you some context um, why this tool exists. Um, obviously, when you build a tool yourself, you often get asked, why didn't you just use another um, thing? So I'll just try to set the stage on, on why we need something like this. Um, then, yeah, we'll talk about the, the thing itself, what is Verta and uh, how does it actually work? And then I'll, I'll use the excuse uh, to um, talk a little bit about how we use the tool to um, to test uh, our kernel driver at, at Limbit. Yeah, so first of all, um, who, who are we? <laughs> I work for Limbit. Um, you might know us from DRBD, um, Distributed Replicated Block Device, um, and that's a Linux kernel driver. So it's just uh, included in the, in the uh, upstream Linux kernel. And it's not entirely important how it works, um, but I'll, I'll try to give some context. I promise this isn't a marketing um, talk about uh, about Limbit. Um, but basically, what it, do, what it does is, is data replication. So at the simplest level, you can imagine it as a RAID 1, but over the network. Um, so you need at least two nodes. Nowadays, actually, we have um, mostly clusters with more nodes, so three or more is more, is more common. And you can kind of see that it's, it sits right in the middle of, of a few, the intersection of a few systems. So um, you, have, um, you have a disk underneath that you want to read and write data from and to, and you have the network on the other side that you need to, to send the, the data over. Um, so we kind of, that's the main point. We have a lot of, um, a lot of connections, I guess, to other subsystems. So, um, those things pose challenges when, when trying to test software. Obviously, when you uh, develop software, you also want to test it. Um, and yeah, that's a challenge because one, uh, one thing I already briefly mentioned is we, we often use three nodes or, or even more, sometimes five nodes. Um, so uh, DBD is fundamentally uh, designed to be run in a cluster and that makes testing more difficult. You need more machines, you need network connections between those and those uh, introduce um, complications. The other thing is, yeah, the network itself. Um, it's um, it's tough to simulate a, a network as it is in reality. You know, you might be replicating over um, some Wi-Fi connection or or the internet or something like that, and it gets flaky, and you need to um, take that, all of that into account. Then, obviously, we also depend on the disk since we are um, a, a storage driver. Um, we need to interface with disks and like networks, disks are also variable in the real world, so we need to um, take that into account. And perhaps the biggest thing is that the actual kernel, so since it's a kernel module, um, it obviously depends on the, on the Linux kernel. Um, and uh, as you may know, not all, especially not enterprise um, users in the real world and, and enterprise customers, they won't be using the latest Linux kernel. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. They probably will be using a pretty old kernel by by kernel developer standards. Um, so you have your, you know, RHEL and, and Ubuntu and and maybe Debian. So we really have a, a quite complex array of, of configurations that we need to test against. Um, lots of distributions and, and kernel versions and stuff like that. So that makes it all a little bit more difficult. So how do you actually test? Um, software in general and how do you test a kernel driver like this. So in, in the olden days, I guess, what you could do is just, you know, take the box in the office that nobody uses anyway, and then take a second one of those, stick a network cable in between, um, and install your software in it every time you do a release and then, um, and then check that everything works and if it's okay, then you can do the release. Obviously, that's not ideal. Um, so. This thing comes along that's called virtual machines. You may have already heard of it. Um, you have just one computer and it's great because it's space efficient. You can have a lot of virtual computers on there. So you may um, 
to a, a virtual machine farm, you know, you have uh, a few Ubuntu hosts on there and maybe two or three rails and a SUSE and I don't know what, um, different kernel versions and then let them talk to each other and see if everything works and, and that's also great. But of, obviously it also has some, some drawbacks, it begs the rhetorical question, is it good enough? Um, obviously it isn't. Um, because you know you sh share a lot of state uh, with these VMs and you have to manually maintain them and do updates and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's annoying. What we really want is to start virtual machines when we actually need them, right? So um, you may know a few tools for this already. The most popular one is probably Vagrant. And I would agree that, that Vagrant is a, a very good candidate for a task like this. Um, the problem is it doesn't integrate really well with the Linux uh, virtualization stack. You have to jump through some hoops and, and the, the images are um, yeah, kind of customized for Vagrant and yeah, it's, it's, it works, but it's not that great of an experience. At least it wasn't for us. Then you may have already heard of, of MultiPass, which is an interesting project because it does almost exactly the same thing as, as Verta. Um, the problem is it's, it's specific to Ubuntu because it's made by Canonical probably. Um, and we don't want that because we also want to test against other distributions. We want to be as generic as possible, right? We want to be as close to what our customers actually or users actually use. Um, another interesting one just, uh, which is just included for reference is AWS Firecracker. Um, it's interesting because it's um, actually a cool concept. It uses very little uh, memory and compute power and uh, it starts small VMs very quickly um, and that's great for testing because the faster your testing is the often you're likely to do it, right? The problem is uh, Firecracker has incredibly specific guest requirements so you need um, some very specific uh, kernels on the guest side um, and that just didn't work out for us. Yeah and then uh, it, it did include Docker but obviously that's not the thing we want because it doesn't run virtual machines. But um, so what we, what we actually want, you all probably know Docker, right? You, we want to pull images, uh, run our, our Ubuntu, just one terminal command. Um, we want to, to um, commit it to a new image, you know, push it to registry so that, so that other people can use it with our modifications. We want to build custom images from, from, from other images. That's all very useful and that stuff we do with Docker all the time. And we want that, but for virtual machines. Can't be that hard, right? So that's how, basically how Verta was, um, was born. I'm obviously oversimplifying a bit. We did go through a few iterations, but basically that's, that's the story. So let's take a look at, at Verta itself. Um, so it's a, a command line tool, similar to how you would use uh, Docker. It's um, a command line interface um, and it works with uh, libvirt. I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, it also uses cloud images, which I'll also talk about, and has some, some pretty cool features um, related to, to image provisioning and, and layering and stuff like that. And most importantly for us, because we are at the end um, developers, it's, it has a, a few um, good interfaces, I guess, for, for scripting and stuff like that, um, parsing inputs and outputs. Um, so you can really integrate it into your development workflow and I'll also show that a little bit later. Yeah, so it's um, obviously open source. Um, you can find it on our GitHub if you're interested. Um, again, this is not a marketing um, talk. Um, this is not like our main product. It's just a cool tool that we, um, we, we did. Yeah, so, so cloud images, I mentioned those. Um, you, you may know that the software cloud in it, um, basically uh, in a nutshell what it does, um, it's, it's a generic OS image, so as generic as they probably come. You just have some uh, standard, I guess, Ubuntu or, or RHEL. Or, um, so it, it, it comes for a lot of distributions, but you have a standard image and you just bring the configuration. So how it technically works is you actually attach a small uh, CD to the, to the VM, like a, a CD-ROM with the configuration in it. Um, and Cloud in it then passes that configuration and you can you know set IP addresses and SSH keys and usernames and passwords and stuff like that. So you can really customize the, the deployment. And lots of people are using that for like mass um, cloud deployments. Um, so to get re reproducible um, cloud instances, but it turns out you can actually use it for this purpose as well. Um, yeah, and it, it, it comes with actually, I think we, we haven't found any really mainstream distribution that doesn't ship 
cloud images. Uh, so these are just some examples, but you can get it from Ubuntu, Fedora, Elm Linux, uh, Rocket Linux, Debian. Um, so, so we're unlikely to have a, an actual um, user or customer who who doesn't use any of these distributions that it's um, that it's available for. Um, and it actually turns out, even if the distribution doesn't support it, you can still build the images if you know what you're doing a little bit. Um, yeah, then I also mentioned libvirt. Um, many will probably know this, but um, it's the, I guess, the standard virtualization uh, daemon for the Linux virtualization stack. It, it supports a lot of other stuff, but um, it also supports QEMU and, and KVM, so you can manage your um, domains, as they call it, so virtual machines. Um, you can manage those um, with, a, with a daemon. And that's really convenient for us because we don't want to manage all that stuff when we're writing a tool. We just want to interface with another tool that already does that pretty well and um, take that load off of ourselves. Um, and apart from VMs, it also manages um, storage uh, for us, so where to actually store the images and, and what format and stuff like that. And it, and it also um, manages networks and devices and, and everything that we might want. Um, the configuration is in, in XML. It's a bit of an uh, exotic format, but it, it works well and, and we can just generate it. So Verta generates that configuration um, and we can create VMs from that. Um, yeah, then I also briefly mentioned QCOW2. Um, that's the, the image format um, that, that Verta primarily uses. So the cool thing about uh, QCOW2 is, um, so it, it stands for QEMU copy on write um, disk format. So it um, supports copy on write, which is um, convenient because you only, um, you, you can make the image pretty small and once you write to it, it, it gets bigger on demand, right? So you, it's pretty space efficient to store. Um, and the other cool thing about it is you can store things in layers. So you have a, a base layer, which is just your, um, your Ubuntu, uh, for example. And then you can create overlays based on that. Um, so when you're building a new image, you can just only store the modifications. You don't need to store the entire image every time, um, which is, is quite convenient. Um, and what that means for, for Verta, and I, I won't go into too much of the technical details here, but it's uh, convenient because um, every time we start a VM, we can just take the base layer and then put an empty QCA2 image on top of that and just write the modifications um, to it. So if you start 100 Ubuntu VMs or 100 RHEL VMs, you only need one base image and like the sum of all the modifications. Um, and that's very space efficient and very quick to start VMs because you don't need to do any copying of data or cloning or stuff, uh, stuff like that. So that works very well for that purpose. Yeah, so it's, uh, I've talked about what, what Verta is. It's important to also note what it is not. Um, so it's, despite the maybe misleading name at first, it's not a virtualization software actually, it just generates input for virtualization software to use. That job is offloaded to, to, to QEMU or KVM. Um, and it's also not a virtual machine manager. It doesn't manage your machines for you. That's, that's libvirt's job. Um, again, it just generates the configuration and passes it to libvirt. Um, so in a way you could, could almost say it's, a, it's like a front end for, for libvirt and cloud in it. Um, yeah, it's also not a, a way to actually run your test suite. Um, that's the job of another tool, which I will briefly touch on later. Um, that's maybe not as generally useful, but we think it's also pretty useful for us, which is called VMShed. Um, and of course, it's not really Docker, which um, should now be obvious because Docker uh, doesn't actually start virtual machines. Right, so let's take a, a look at how it would actually look like to, to use Verta. Um, so let's, let's say we're trying to pull an image. Uh, we just say Verta image pull, right? And then let's do an Ubuntu Noble. If we know the cloud image URL, we can just supply that and it will, it will download the image and uh, get it into the right format, upload it to libvirt and, and we have an image. Um, conveniently, uh, Verta also had an image registry. So kind of similar to, to how the Docker registry, um, uh, the, the Docker Hub registry works. Um, you can just do Verta image pull Ubuntu Noble and it has uh, just a, a file somewhere that, that knows the URL for that and it does the same thing. It just downloads it and, and you have the image. So that's also convenient. Uh, speaking of Docker, um, one really cool feature is that actually Verta images are compatible with Docker registries. 
So you can just take your Noble image, Ubuntu Noble image that you downloaded from the, the Ubuntu uh, website and you can push it to an actual Docker registry. So that registry at limbit.com is an internal registry at, at limbit and then the namespace VM um, it's just some namespace and then you, you can just push it like any other Docker image. Of course, you done, then can't do a Docker run from that image. It's not like compatible in that way, but um, that, that should be obvious. It's just you can, uh, you don't have to export the image and upload it to an HTTP share somewhere. You can just uh, upload it to a Docker registry. And of course, that also means you, you can pull from a Docker registry as well. And this is super useful. We use it all the time um, because we build custom base images for our tests that have like all the testing software um, installed um, in them. And we just push them to our Docker registry and we can share them. Um, yeah, so that's, that's very convenient. Um, yeah, of course, we don't just want to push images around. We also want to run virtual machines and that's as easy as doing the VM run, Ubuntu Noble. Um, you'll notice that we need to supply an ID. Um, the reason for that is Verta will actually manage the IP address of the, of the virtual machine for you. So um, I don't know if you've run across that, but I certainly have if you've started like VMs with libvirt um, and you just, you know, um, import the ISO and run through the installer, they get a, a IP address via um, THCP and that's obviously random. Um, so you need to look up the IP and, and that's kind of cumbersome. And to work around that, Verta actually allocates a, an, an IP range to itself in the, in the virtual network. And the ID you pass here is just the last digit of the IP address. So you always know um, what IP address your, your VM is going to have. Um, and you'll also note that we can supply a name for the VM, but we didn't here. So it just built it from the image name and the, the ID. So that's also, we think, pretty logically. Um, yeah, and once we started the VM, we can just SSH into it, but the VM SSH, and it basically works like the normal SSH command, and we just get a shell, um, and we have an, an Ubuntu Noble. And if we check the IP address, we can see the 192, 168, 122 is the, the IP range, so we have 255 IDs to work with. By default, you can also change those defaults, but um, yeah, you get the, the suffix kind of uh, is the ID of the VM. And that's obviously very useful when, when running tests against it because you just know um, what your VMs are, especially if you're starting multiple VMs. Speaking of which, um, if we use this uh, count parameter here, we can just start three VMs. And um, that's, I think, another um, powerful part of it that, you know, usually you would um, run through the installer three times or maybe clone it and it's a bit cumbersome here you just supply count three and um, it just does 10 11 and 12 and you have three um, three vms at the same time um, yeah and then you also can supply um, all sorts of other stuff um, so maybe you want to attach a disk we do that a lot because the rbd obviously needs um, backing disks so Let's say you want a, a two gigabyte SCSI disk attached to your to your VM. Just apply the disk parameter, and um, and it will do that. So you have three VMs with with a, a second disk. Then you can also attach network interfaces. We also sometimes do that. Um, so so I won't touch on that here because it gets a bit too technical. But Verta can actually also manage networks for you. So maybe you want to test. Um, what happens if you have two different network interfaces that combine in some way? You can just add a, a different virtual net, and that's just a libvirt network. And then you can add a second um, network card to the VM, and it will just have um, two IP addresses. Um, I can't obviously touch on anything here, uh, on everything here, but um, there's a lot of other options you can you can pass. Um, like you can choose how much RAM and how much CPU cores your, your machine should have, um, and that's all configurable. Yeah, so, so another um, really cool part of, of Docker and also of, of Verta is the ability to provision images, right? So you, you take a base image and you apply some script to it and then it, it becomes another image. Um, so for Verta, we, we have developed a, a custom format based on, on Tomer. Um, 
So um, basically what you do on the right is a very simple example here. What you do is you have a, a bunch of steps, right? And um, there's, a, there's different types of steps. For example, this is a shell step and it does what you would expect. It just runs a shell script, right? So in this case, you just write hello world to, to some file and, and output what kernel we're running on. And that's the provisioning script. Um, and we have um, a few different options on what we can do with that um, provisioning script. script. Um, one thing is, um, which we do a lot, like we have a started VM and we want to modify it in some way, or we want to run some, some stuff with that VM, we can run and run it on a, on a running instance. The other thing is kind of like Docker build. You can run it, um, like start a VM from a base image, then apply the provisioning and then commit it again. And that's one, one operation. Um, for example, if we had an, a running Ubuntu Noble VM, like Ubuntu Noble 10, we could just do Verta VM exec, um, supply the provisioning file, and yeah, we can see the VM starts up. Um, it says hello world, writes it to the file, and we can see what kernel we're running on. Um, that's, that's one uh, mode of provisioning. And the other, which we also do a lot for, for tests, is to, to build a new image. So you can also see um, it starts the Ubuntu Noble image, applies the provisioning, um, and saves it as a new image. Um, and that's again just one operation, it's just one, one command line um, command away. And if we start that image and, and check out the file, it, it will be, be there. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing about that is again, it, it will only save the modifications for it. You, so you don't have two Ubuntu images now, you just have one Ubuntu image and the layered um, provisioned image on top. So that just takes up very little space. Yeah, so that's um, what it can do. Uh, let's, uh, so this, I guess, was the, the main part, the, the, the practical part um, of, of how it works and, and what you can do with it. Now comes the, I guess, inspiration part or the, the um, part where I explain where, uh, how we actually use it for, for actually testing a, a, a driver every day. Um, so one thing I mentioned already is, is VM shed. Um, it's a, yeah, kind of a stupid name. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be a VM scheduler and it, yes, it did start out as a typo in the beginning, but you can imagine it's a shed where you store your VMs into if you want. Um, and basically what it, what it does it is, is it runs uh, test suites, right? So for DBD we have an integration test suite, which we just um, run um, periodically. Um, and it just um, starts a bunch of Verta VMs in, in using the, the techniques that we talked about. Um, starts a, 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 a farm, I guess, of VMs or a shed. Um, runs some some script against it. In our case, we, we wrote it in Python, but it really doesn't matter what test we to use. Um, and reports the results back to you. And you just configure it with two files. Um, one of them looks like this, where you configure your virtual machines, right? Um, so you can basically supply all the th stuff that you can supply to Verta, and that's because it just passes it to Verta. Um, you, you know, add disks and, and supply the base image and, and how much memory it should have. And yes, this is not a joke, it actually can run Windows. Um, if you try hard enough and know how to ma make an image, you can actually run Windows Server. And, and we do that for um, our Windows port of DVD. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the other file is, is tests.toml, which, um, which supplies your, your tests, right? Um, so that's basically just scripts um, to run. This is an excerpt of the, of the DBD test suite. Um, and what you can do there is you just supply, you know, the name of the test, which should match the, the script name and the amount of VMs that it should run against. So in most cases, it's, it's two or three VMs for DBD. But here for the connect test, we have either, uh, you have two and, and five VMs, so it will run all permutations of that. And speaking of permutations, you also can supply variants. So for example, for DBD, um, DBD can communicate over RDMA or TCP. Um, so we want to test both of that, but it's you know the same test case, but with just a different configuration. So we can do permutations of that uh, using the, the variants. And you'll notice at the, at the very top here, you supply a test suite file, and that's just a word, the provisioning um, script that I talked about before, that just runs your test suite, you know, it executes the Python script. 
Um, so that's how you would run it. Um, it's not very spectacular, just the two files and then it runs. Um, and again, the, how it works, um, it's, it's, it's pretty efficient because um, first of all, we build um, test images. So that's a temporary image where you basically store your, or you, you implant your device under test, right? So for DVD, we want to, um, in the base image, we have the right, right kernel installed. And for the test image, we want to install the version of DOBD we want to test, right? And we don't want to do that at the beginning of every test because it's just the same action over and over again. So we build a test image at the start um, and then run all the tests against that and then throw the test image away again. Yeah, once we have all the test images, it builds those for every, every um, distribution or every VM that we specify. Once we have that, um, it starts the required VMs, so two VMs or, or three or five um, based on the test. Um, and you can supply a limit on, on how much, on how many VMs it will start in parallel. So um, on our testing infrastructure, we have uh, 24 VMs started in parallel at every time and VM shed will take care that only this amount of VMs is started at any point. Um, yeah, and once the VMs are up, it just runs the test suite script and executes the Python script, maybe in a, in a Docker container, um, however, however you like. Um, and once it's all run, it displays the results. And that's what it looks like in practice. Um, for the DVD test suite, just an excerpt, but you, you have all these different combinations of VMs here. So it actually mixes through the, the VMs, um, which is nice because we want, we don't just want to test that an Ubuntu VM can talk to an Ubuntu VM. We also want an Ubuntu VM to be able to talk to a Red Hat VM and, and all these combinations. So you get quite a lot of, of coverage um, from that. Um, and yeah, then it just does all the permutations of the tests. And in the end, it displays the results in a, in a table. Um, for the DVD test suite, that's 102 tests um, and how long, how long it took. Um, yeah, so speaking of, of testing and, and this output actually comes from GitLab CI. Um, to anyone who's tested modern software in, in, uh, in the recent past, it won't come as a surprise that CI pipelines are very useful and we just use GitLab CI. You can just, we can use any, any number of tools, but it works very well for us because um, Verta or VMshed actually makes it very easy to run the whole regression test suite, so the 102 VM uh, tests. Um, against basically every commit that we make to the RBD, right? So every merge request that we open in GitLab uh, runs against this test suite. And the convenient thing is because, well, partly because our testing infrastructure is very powerful, but also because um, the, the starting and, and cloning of VMs is so efficient, it only takes about seven minutes uh, to run the whole test suite. And again, the quicker your tests are, the often you're likely to run them and the less bugs you're probable to have um, or the more bugs you're probable to spot. Um, yeah, and what we also do um, is that we run uh, stability tests. So only the um, integration tests are sometimes not enough. Um, it's, it's only a hundred tests, right? And they test a lot of scenarios, but as I said, sometimes the network can be flaky or disks can be flaky or behavior in, in DRBD itself can be um, interesting. And it only shows up in one in every uh, thousand tests. So what we do is every night at uh, I think 11 p.m. we start a run of stability tests and that takes five or six hours, but it doesn't matter because hopefully we'll, we're all asleep at that time. Um, and it runs about, what is it, 4,000? I think it's every test in the test suite 40 times. So that's also a feature of VMshed. It can just repeat the test runs a lot. And here you can see that was a, obviously a test run that in, introduced some, some flakiness because about 8% of the tests were failing at that time. And you can um, react to that and, and see how it failed in, in just one of those 100 test runs, right? Um, and adding to that, and this is getting further and further from the actual point um, of testing, but adding to that, you can actually use VMshed to export that data and you can pretty conveniently import into it into Elasticsearch. And we internally use a, a Kibana dashboard for that um, to, to display the test results. So on, uh, you can see here the, um, so every like column is, is one test and it's I think uh, a month or something of data. Um, and you can see, for example, in like the, 
the middle there, it, it drops a little bit, so we obviously introduced some kind of bug there. Um, but the nice thing is we have all the logs, we have all the, the results, we can just look what happened there and fix it. Um, and that really adds to, to the stability when you're testing your software. Yeah, so uh, in conclusion, if you think you could benefit from it, go check out Werther. Um, it's on our, on our GitHub, um, github.com slash limbit. Um, and yeah, maybe it's, it's useful to you when you're testing your software. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the way we do that is um, we build the kernel in a different pipeline, you know, like um, in a, also in GitLab CI, for example, and um, you have an RPM fall, of, fall out of that or, or a Debian package, and then you can just make a provisioning script um, for Werther that installs that kernel, right? So what we actually do is we don't use the stock um, like Ubuntu base images or the stock rel base images, but before we actually run the, the test suite, we take the image and install the kernel that we want into that um, and, and then run it. And obviously you can use a custom kernel that you compile yourself. We actually most often, because as you know, DRBD is most often used as an external module. Um, we, we actually just use the enterprise kernels from distributions because again, we want to be as close to what our customers are actually using as, as possible. So we catch the bugs that they are catching. But you could also use it for, for upstream um, self-compiled kernel stuff, yeah. Yes. Any kind <laughs> of contributors? No, uh, so as I mentioned, this isn't our main um, yeah, thing, right? Yeah. So, so we're not looking to make, to make money of this, basically. Um, but um, I just personally find that the tool uh, uh, good to use and, and uh, very cool. And I personally would be happy if people, you know, just use it, maybe file issues with, uh, we, we've had users that use very exotic combinations of, of images and, and, and provisioning scripts and stuff and, and find all con kinds of weird bugs. And sometimes that's just fun to, to, to fix, right? And it makes the, the tool better. We don't really expect any, any huge corporations or anything to, to jump on the bandwagon here and, and actually use it. But um, if you have a... Why not? Yeah, uh, maybe, yeah, you know, <laughs> maybe. Um, but um, yeah, the way we use it and it's, yeah, you know, we are not a, a real big enterprise ourselves, right? Um, but, but for um, like medium sized, I guess, um, software development of efforts that don't have like data centers worth of, of uh, build farms and stuff, it can be pretty useful. Yeah. Yes. So uh, Vagrant is, is a, a good tool, and by the way, this isn't my, my real line of work either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't develop um, testing tools for a living, but it's just something that I find kind of fun. And we did um, toy with Vagrant and, and actually use it in our testing um, procedure for a bit. Um, the main thing, I guess, was that it's, it doesn't feel at home in the Linux virtualization stack, right? The, the main purpose, um, you, you always have the feeling that the main purpose is VirtualBox. And of course, if you want to reuse VirtualBox, that's also fine. Um, but in, in our case, um, you know, we, you have, we have all the, our testing and, and build hosts are Linux based, obviously. And it just felt more at home um, to have a, a solution that 
cleanly integrates with libvirt and the virtualization stack as opposed to you know with Reagan you have to install a plugin to use libvirt and and it's just a bit more clunky but um, in general it's it's a fine tool and it, it does if you know how to use it right it does pretty much the same thing right is there any connection with <laughs> no, <laughs> we moved we moved away from Vagrant before that license change. So um, even though I also don't approve of that, but <laughs> um, yeah, that's not the main reason. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Sorry, the question firecracker. Please elaborate on the differentiation. Yeah. Um, I. Um, I wasn't sure if I should even include it because I'm, I, we didn't play around with it that much because it quickly became apparent that it's not right for the task we're trying to achieve. But basically, almost all of the tools that we, we evaluated and tested for this have the same problem and that's they are not generic enough, right? They always depend on some kind of um, thing either on the host or on the guest. And what we want is really basically the system that the customer will be running or the user will be running. Um, we want to run that in our VMs. So um, for Firecracker specifically, um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but you need uh, like actual drivers inside the kernel and you need a very specific, very recent kernel version and you, you actually need to compile it uh, yourself and, and that's just not what our customers are going to be using. And also I think the Firecracker project was actually uh, continued if I remember correctly, but um, yeah, so it's, it just, it's good for, for some tasks, um, obviously, but um, just not for this one. Yeah. All right, no more questions? Great, thank you.